Hey, Andrew, this is everyone. Everyone, this is Andrew Jervis. Please make him feel welcome. Hello. Andrew's come from Cali, right? I've come from where? California. I have, yes. And uh, he's come to talk to us about the trials, the tribulations, and the realities of running an independent record label in 2006 and beyond, we hope. We do hope. Right. Yeah. So if you could just start off and tell us, a, well, tell us about yourself, um, where you're based, and where you're from. I currently reside in Berkeley, just outside of San Francisco. I've been in the Bay Area for about 15 years now. And the reason that I'm sitting in this seat right now is I don't know yet. It was all one big kind of accident. I didn't mean to be in the record business. I didn't even mean to live in the Bay Area. Uh, up until the age of 18, I was living in London um, and prior to that, other parts of England. And um, at a whim, moved to San Francisco and everything kind of snowballed. And here I am right now. It's one big kind of bizarre trip. And uh, w one thing. Benji and I were talking about earlier is that I definitely don't know everything. Um, we're constantly making mistakes and finding out new things every single day. Um, but that's just part of the fun of running an independent label. But how long have you been doing it? Uh, literally since the, I guess you could say since the day I got here. To because, America? Yeah, I, I got off the plane. I went to my dorm room. I actually decided I was going to finish my journalism degree at the University of San Francisco. And uh, before I got on the plane, I bought two records from Honest John's Records in London. And they're on this label called Love and Hate. And I had a phone number in San Francisco. And I thought, I must call those people when I get to San Francisco. Took them in my little box of about this many records. Sat in this really depressing dorm room that didn't know anybody. I realized I'd moved to San Francisco and I had no idea what it was about. I didn't know where Hate Street was. Uh, I was moving there with my roommate from London who was going to show up in a couple of weeks' time. I thought, well, I guess I should call these people. And I gave them a shout and said, hey, you know, I like the two records that you put out. And they said, well, we're a record store, why don't you come down? I ran down to the record store with my little box of records. And um, strangely, we hit it off. And uh, the, the two people in the record store were a couple called Michael and Jody McFadden. Uh, they'd had this store called The Groove Merchant for about a year and um, two weeks later they were going on a buying trip across the States and they wanted someone to look after the store for them so I was hired. So what was the store called? The store is called The Groove Merchant and it's still there. We don't own it anymore though at this point. And that's on Hate Street in California, right? It is. Okay, yes. and at this stage their label wasn't Ubiquity, it was called what? Love and Hate Records. It was a reissue label basically started this record store, um, they were DJs. They'd been throwing a lot of parties and Rare Groove was the kind of sound of the, of the time. When are we talk, what, what year are we we're talking, talking about? Uh, I mean, they'd been doing it for a few years and I got there in 1990. Right. The label was only two 12 inches old though, so really maybe six months to a year old mm -hmm. at, at the most. And the reason they started the label was that they couldn't keep up with demand. They were selling Rare Grooves to collectors, producers, kids from all our, around the world were coming to the Groove Merchant to buy tunes. Mm. And we just impossible to, you know, keep mining stuff to the, mm. to the demand that was there. So we thought, well, we're here in the States, the artists are here in the States, why don't we track them down and we can reissue their records. Mm. We'll definitely touch on reissuing later, but then that label spawned a sister label, which has gone on to be very successful called Ubiquity. Ubiquity yeah, this kid walked in the store, I, Actually, I don't know when he first came in or if he called Mike or Jody, but a guy from San Diego walked in and had a demo, and it was very much influenced by the music that we were reissuing, but kind of was looking forward to, to and uh, his name happened to be Grey Boy. Mm -hmm. And uh, Grey Boy was a, a sort of a party DJ down in San Diego, and we really liked his demo. And for probably less than two or three thousand uh, dollars, his album was completed and put out and on no marketing, no nothing, just happened to be in the right place at the right time, ended up selling in excess of 50, 70,000 copies at this point. Wow. I had tracks licensed left, right and center, is in major movies all over the place mm -hmm. and 
So we kind of started Ubiquity with a big So it was a pretty bang. decent start. Yeah, it's just been downhill since. <laughs> and so you've been doing Ubiquity records for 15 years. It's an independent record label. Um, for those of us in the room that might not be completely familiar with the catalogue, um, we should play some music, but just before you do, what's the, what's the musical ethos of the label? What's the musical vision that kind of links all the things that you do? Well, I think we'll get into some of how we ended up with the sound that we have now, maybe a little later, sure. but um, we basically have three labels. Cubop is our kind of smallest label, and to be honest with you, it's a little bit, it's on the back burner right now. We do very few projects on Cubop. It's an Afro-Cuban and Latin jazz label. We have Love and Hate, which is the reissue label for old school soul, funk, and jazz. And we have Ubiquity, which is all kinds of electronic music, hip hop, soul, dance music, house, whatever you want to call it. And the idea behind the label has always been, well, if we like it, we'll put it out. Mm. So give us, like uh, give us some examples of artists that you, you've got out at the moment. Um, right now, we've had a great year with the Platinum Pie Pipers. It's a band from uh, originally Detroit and I guess now residing in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. uh, featuring Wajid, who's part of the whole Slum Village crew back in the day, uh, kind of blurring the lines between soul and hip hop and electronic music. And his uh, ethos, I guess, is somewhat typical of where, what we want to be doing. Um, we still have Grey Boy, still kicking around 15 mm -hmm. years later. Um, we have other Detroit artists like John Arnold and Jeremy Ellis. Um, and we have a definite West Coast kind of bent too, with bands like Breakestra, um, people like that. Does that kind of give you a... So should we check out some music? Let's, let's hear some music to um, find out what... You know, give us, give us a spectrum, just maybe okay. one or two pieces, a minute or so. so. The first thing I was going to give you a quick spin of is this guy called Durando, who's um, actually was a pimp back in the day and um, has recently been discovered. He now lives up in Northern California, and the guy is super cool. He's a great character. Um, he disappeared for a, a whole number of years because the life that he was living was a little bit fast. He was driving around uh, the Bay Area in a white Rolls Royce with a Durando license plate, and I guess having fun with people like Fillmore Slim, and he hung out with Sly Stone and all these guys. And back in the day, he recorded three 45s. Um, they're all brilliant and we're going to reissue them. We actually found some unreleased music that we did, so this is a sample of the kind of stuff that we do on, on the Love and Hate label. And that's uh, coming out on the Love and Hate label next year sometime. So Love and Hate is the, the, the kind of old school label, basically. Yeah, the reissue label. And that's the foundation for what you do now? Um, I guess. I yeah. mean, originally, yeah. it, it was the label that we started with, um, right. and therefore, I guess one foot will always be in the past while the other one is moving forward. And you're still reissuing stuff as and when you think it might be of interest to diggers all around the world? Yeah, I mean, with this stuff, it's amazing. You still are able to find new old music, mm -hmm. you know, new things that people hadn't discovered, like Durando is a sleeper. 345s on obscure Bay Area labels, mm -hmm. and um, I didn't know about him two years ago, but spent some time getting to know him, and here we are putting out his record. Cool. All right, let's hear some uh, ubiquity, some new business. How about some Platinum Pipe Pipers, as we were just talking about them. This is Planet by Packers with Sarah. So we're applauding two groups that have been really interesting to me. Um, certainly as a DJ, I've been very passionate about their music, Platinum Pie Pipers and Sarah Creative Partners, you know, both at the cutting edge of soul music in 2005. Um, well, certainly from my perspective anyway. Um, they are really, you know, progressive and exciting artists. I mean, how does it work with the independent label thing, you know, get, getting hold of such people? How, at what point in their career do you, do you have to grab them? Um, I mean, I guess with both of those, 
we grabbed them at the beginning of mm -hmm. both of those projects uh, and kind of got them where they are now. Mm. Uh, I'm, and not, I'm not saying that you know, to boost my own ego, but that's just the way that it happened. Right. I think a lot of the times the music that you like as a, as a radio personality and a DJ, it filters up through you and then you'll see other people playing it and, 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 and getting behind it. And in a similar way, it's what happens with, with labels. You right. know, and there will be labels like Ubiquity putting out artists like Platinum Pie Pipers, and then you know you'll see them, you know, doing remixes for Atlantic or whoever, and, and that's just mm -hmm. the way this kind of thing works. Well, we'll definitely get on to artist development and that side of thing later on in the chat. But um, the main things that I want to achieve today is really just breaking down everything simply from two perspectives: one from a label perspective. You know, should any of us decide that we want to put our own records out or indeed start an independent label? And also from an artist's perspective of what we should and shouldn't do, you know, when approaching a label or how sure. not to get done over and what to watch out for and that kind of thing. I mean, what's your position at Ubiquity? Is it as an A&R? Yeah, I mean, officially I'm vice president and head mm -hmm. of A&R. But, you know, Ubiquity's got seven or eight people working at it, so pack boxes and... So that's the scale of the operation we're talking about. It's seven, seven or eight people, yeah. full time. You got it. Right. And how many records have you put out over the years? Well, probably somewhere around 300 or so at this mm -hmm. point, mm -hmm. including albums, singles, whatever. So, okay, talk to us like we're all just starting from scratch. What, what is A&R? What does A&R stand for? Artist and repertoire. And when you're an A&R person, what do you do? Um, responsible really for the sound of the label. Mm -hmm. What kind of records are we putting out? What kind of artists are we going to sign? Um, where are we heading? Mm -hmm. What are the mistakes we've made musically in the past that we won't make again? So let us into the brain of an A&R person. When you're looking at you know, assessing the musical landscape out there, you've seen there's a little bit of heat on this, you like the sound of that. You know, what are the factors that make you make that call, pick up the phone, chase down an artist, you know? Um, really, it comes down to the whole thing we said about the ethos of the label. Do we like it? Right. And if something grabs me straight away, there's nothing going to stop me picking up the phone mm. and, and saying, hey, and, um, you know, maybe I heard a track on your radio show mm. from some guy that sent you a, you know, a demo. Maybe someone sent me a demo. I mean, really, it just starts from... I heard this one track and I, and I really liked it and if I don't get off my ass and make the phone call or send an email or make some investigations, it's not going to happen and no one's going to bite my hand off if, you know, if I mm. do call and they don't want to sign to Ubiquity or whatever. It's an independent label. Do you think it's a, a fair statement at this stage in you know, the music industry to say that labels that where, where people pick up the phone on the basis of how the music sounds as opposed to how much they think it might shift? are kind of few and far between? Probably. I think we definitely operate in a completely different way from much larger labels. Mm. Just in the way that a lot of the music that ends up coming out on Ubiquity happens somewhat organically and isn't, you know, I don't really have the, I must put together a super group mentality, yeah. you know, although we do have some interesting collaborations yeah. between artists that we think might work well together. It's not generally how we operate. Mm. somehow the music filters through me and whether it's because I heard a 12 inch or because someone sent me a good demo or because I went to see a band just the way it happens but yeah maybe we're in the minority as, as independence. I mean I don't think with a label like yours anyone looking at it would be in any doubt of why it started it's obviously like-minded people wanting to put good music out and that's right. clear but in the lifespan of 15 years there must come a point where you have to balance that with the reality of the commercial world and how, how do you strike that balance between needing to make money and surviving and just staying completely true to your ethics musically? Two things, and maybe we'll get into one of them in, in a bit. But first of all, we, as an independent label, we don't just put out records. I mean, we can get to that in a little while. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, probably halfway through this process of getting here, kind of realized not every record we're going to do it's going to be a hit and there's almost no point in you know uh 
working so hard that you cry at the end of the day because you know the local radio station didn't play your new Grey Boy single or something like that. It's just not going to happen, and you have to be somewhat honest in your assessment of how these records are going to do. And that obviously we do pay some attention to who we're going to sign, and even though I say, okay, we just put out the music we like, at some point, if there's absolutely no chance of some, anybody else liking the record, we're not going to do it. Mm. Um, but um, I, think that, uh, I think that what we realized halfway along was that it's okay to be a label that puts out records that are only going to sell a few thousand copies alongside records that are going to sell a lot more. It's okay to have little niche records. We, some of the stuff that we reissue on Love and Hate is so obscure. You know, we put out a, a Japanese jazz record last year that had just two tracks on it. I mean, if I went, and, and I think, you know, maybe a handful of people around the world knew about it. What record are you talking about? It's called Black Renaissance. But the thing about Black Renaissance is that for people in a certain niche of record buyers, you know, that was always like a £350 record to buy. But it's so you know that there is like loads of people out there that can't afford to spend you know five hundred dollars or whatever it is on a record. Sure. And but they want that record. So in a way, that is a commercially motivated move as well, no? Definitely. But you hit the nail on the head. We said niche. Right. And I think if I took something like black, if I was working at um, you know, at Sony or somewhere, mm -hmm. and and I was in the A and R department, I said I really want to reissue this record, and maybe we'll sell five thousand copies. I'd probably get my pink slip. Yeah, you know that night. So, so you effectively, you're saying it's about be, being realistic about what you're dealing with, all your margins from yeah. from the word go. Sure. Yeah. And you know, I've, uh, one of my jobs that I really like doing is tracking down these old artists um, and letting them know that there are a group of people out there who are willing to pay stupid money for their record. Yeah. Um, and asking them if they have a box in their garage. But <laughs> uh, you know that that's such a great honour to be able to do that, to tell mm. someone like Harry Whittaker, who was the man behind the Black Renaissance record, that his record's this huge record, mm. and that people still love it, and that it's the source of, you know, uh, much excitement on the dance floor somewhere over around the world, and, you know, gets played in London on the radio. I mean, that's news to these guys, and they maybe haven't thought about that record in about 20 years. Mm. So, you know, that's a, that's a definite fun part of the job. Um, but, you know, when you tell these guys, you also have to be honest with them, and, and you know their eyes might light up when you start talking about dollars and stuff. But I have to be uh, realistic and tell them, look, we might only sell five thousand, seven thousand, ten thousand copies of, mm -hmm. of your of your record because it's got a limited market. Mm. It's just the way it goes. And if we, as an independent label, if I can balance that with selling thirty, forty thousand copies of a Breakestra album or a Grey Boy record or mm. what, what have you, then great, we can all stay in business. Okay, so let's bring it back to the modern context. Um, this is my track that I've just finished. No, this is my five-track demo. I knew you were right. using this for us. <laughs> no, if I, say, if I said this to you, are you going to listen to it? Or is it going to end up... I mean, what, demystify the demo bin myth. What, what, what happens in your office? Is there a pile of CDs that you go through? Do you, do, will you actually listen to stuff that you haven't already heard a rumour about or someone recommends to you? Yeah, absolutely. Probably slower than I would, you know, than if I heard it on share a show like Deviation or something. But no, if someone sends me a demo blank, just out of the blue, it goes in a box of demos for that week. I don't let it go beyond more than two weeks because I'll be in trouble and there'll be a massive box in the corner of the office just looking at me and I know it's just going to take up an entire day. Mm. But I listen to everything that comes through the door. I don't know if every other, everyone else does, but I do listen to everything because there are things that can be missed. Um, if, if, if you don't, and you just end up kicking yourself. Um, so yes, I listen to everything that comes through. I don't need a massive pa package with your picture and your life story, and I don't need it FedEx. It just shows me that you have no regard for money if you're going to FedEx me something, because I, I don't have time to listen to your demo the second that someone sends it and I sign for it. You know, the post system works just fine. Send me your demo, I promise you I'll listen to it. Hmm. And um, I'll get, I get back to everybody who sends me a demo. Hmm. But on the other hand, you know, it's not that useful if you get a kind of unmarked blank CDR with not much no, information, right? Please put your email address on it. I don't have time to call you. If, if I don't like it or it's not suitable for Ubiquity, I don't have time to give you personal feedback on every record because that would just take up 
the entire week and it's just not realistic. Okay, so I've sent you my CD, you listened to it and you liked it and you're thinking actually, you know what, we might do a 12-inch with him or we might do a, an album with these guys or whatever. Give me a walkthrough from start to finish when you've made that decision, what happens? between that moment and the record coming out, but I want everything, like everything you have to do, everything you have to think about, contracts, artwork, manufacturing, the whole bit. Okay, okay. <laughs> Benji, thank you for your demo. <laughs> We're pretty interested. Um, I mean, it starts with a, you know, a phone call and feeling them out. I mean, someone might have sent me something great and I call them and they're absolutely off their rocker. Well, you know, it's probably not worth doing. What's mm. the old phrase about, you know, if the honeymoon's no good, then forget about the marriage, right? And there's plenty of artists out there who are artists and they're creative geniuses and they may be very difficult to work with and it's, you kind of have to weigh up, you know, when I get out of bed tomorrow and my day is going to be all about working with this guy, is that the guy I really want to be spending my time with? I mean, part of this is it's a music business, it's supposed to be fun, right? So I kind of have to work out Okay, is this guy sane? This woman, is she sane? Um, and does she get what we're all about? Are we all on the same page as far as expectations? Mm -hmm. um, do they like how we operate? Um, I'll explain possibly a little bit about the kind of things that we might do as far as, you know, do we put out singles and how does a remix work and when would your album come out when, you know, there's a lot of stuff that a lot of artists don't know. And they expect that if you, you know, sometimes you'll get an, an, an album's worth in a demo and they're like, great, you want it? Well, can we put it out? Can we put it out next week? And no, you know, these things take time. So you kind of have to walk through the process with the artist just like I'm going to walk through you now. Um, let's say that the, that the album is complete to keep things. Okay. Easy. Maybe it needs a couple of touches here and there. If it isn't, are you paying for the mix down and all that kind of stuff? Uh, regardless of whether it's finished or not, we're going to offer you an amount of money for the album and what you spend it on is up to you. Okay, so this is the crucial bit I want to know now. So that money is everything? That's your advance. And out of the advance, if my, if my record's not quite finished and I need to buy this bit of equipment, that's coming out of it. If I need to get a mix engineer to mix it properly, that's coming out of it too? You got it. What about mastering? We handle mastering. Okay. I use one mastering guy um, called George Horn and he's been doing it for about... <clears throat> 40 years, he works at Fantasy Records, which happens to be in Berkeley, which is very handy, but he's one of the best mastering guys around, at least on the West Coast and definitely in the States. Mm. Um, a lot of artists, you know, I understand that this is their baby, you know, and, and uh, they want to be involved from the start to the end, um, and they want their friend to do the mastering, or their friend to do the artwork, or something like that, but there's certain things I think, as if you're running a label, you have to know that maybe you know best, fingers crossed, having done it for 15 years. And so, uh, in your case, Benji, I'm going to take your, your demos uh, after you've mixed them. I'm going to take them to Fantasy and we're going to get them mastered there. If you want to provide me with some notes on how you think things can be improved, I'll happily take those to the session with me. So you don't let me come and sit in there and... Uh, you can come too, yeah. Okay. But cool. you've got to make your way to Berkeley. All right, so you phoned me up and you've said... Um, into what you're doing and we're going to give you this much money to do a record for us or for, you, for us to facilitate putting it out. Yeah. Then? Then, we have some legal business to take care of, Benji. Well, that, this is the bit that most people who aren't clued up on the record business need to know about. You know, as boring as it might be, and that's probably why it's a turn-off to most of us, but the legal stuff is, you know, I mean, without wanting to go into a kind of, you know, clause for kind of situation, can you just break down what legal stuff needs to be discussed at that stage? You basically need to come up with an agreement that works for the label and works for the artist, that keeps everybody happy, um, where the artists feel like they're going to get, they're going to be looked after, that they're going to get payments down the line, that they're covered, um, and the same applies to the label, that the, the label needs to know that the artist is going to turn around and sue the label for, you know, putting their picture on the album cover or something, you know, mm. it's basically, uh, unfortunately, more and more an insanely large document that everybody has to be happy with. 
And um, from the artist side, okay. it's probably good that you read up on this kind of thing. And you, you need, there's plenty of books about you know everything you need to know about the music business. Read a couple of books before you sign an agreement. If you have to get yourself a manager or a lawyer, check them out before you do it. But get yourself a, a lawyer or a manager. In our case, we always make it plainly obvious to the artist that we're an independent label. I'm not here to rip you off. I have no time to rip anybody off. I want your record to do great. And if your record does great, we do great. So th there's nothing in the agreement that I'm going to give you that's there to trip you up down yep. the line. I have okay. no time for that. So what, what is a point? What is a point on a record? What, I mean, people just talk about arguing over points that they have on a record. What is a point? Uh, it, it, gets, it can get super technical. And some people, you, points, is, I think, is more, um, more often uh, a European oh, okay. phrase. Uh, right. But basically, it equates to Royalties how much money am I going to get for Each every, time it sells. every unit that's sold. Right. Um, and every country seems to have a different standard um, as far as what kind of percentage you're going to get. Um, and what kind of money is going to be taken out of the con uh, out of your payment? What sort of things are you responsible for? Like, mm -hmm. if we do a video, is that a recoupable expense? Um, if we is artwork and packaging is that uh, an expense that's mm -hmm. going to affect what? Kind and is of this stuff that we can argue about? Yeah, can, we can discuss this. We can. And so, I mean, obviously, taking into account that everything is a case by case example based on the projection of what you're going to sell, etc. You know what. In America, just for the example, um, what is a reasonable thing for us to be expecting to get royalty-wise every time one of our records sells? Honestly, I think that it, it's completely it's too case specific. By case. Yeah. yeah, okay. Because every label has their business set up in a different way. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that we do is we pay, um, we pay everybody the same royalty rate, whether you're a proven seller like Grey Boy or whether you're a new kid on the block. Mm. You're getting the same royalty rate, and we don't do things like take money out for packaging. Mm. When you're selling a CD, we charge that price, and, and what royalty you'll get is derived out of sales mm -hmm. per unit. And just to be honest, because we're an eight person mom and pop independent label with a ton of records and hopefully lots more records to mm. come, if we start changing things too much, it's extremely difficult when it comes to royalty time for the person who takes care of royalties to make sure they get everybody paid. Right. And we want to make sure everyone gets paid. So for us, as an independent label, we try and kind of uh, streamline everything and keep things as simple as possible. Hmm. Now, everything's up for negotiation, but you're not going to get a better deal than, than the best sellers on the label. And if you're getting the same deal as the best sellers on the label, well, take it or leave it. Hmm. Now, we had um, Sir Mix a lot talking about the importance of publishing. And you read you know, in articles all the time, people are like, make sure you've got your publishing. And especially, you know, especially in a genre like hip hop, where so much of the music is sample based and it's increasing the awareness, well, you know what, I'm not even going to use samples in this track because I want to get paid. I don't want to be giving my money away and all that kind of stuff. And right. you read interviews with Just Blaze saying that on you know, Fabulous Breed, they wanted 100% of the publishing. You know, what is publishing? How does that work? When you're sampling a record, what does that mean, giving away my publishing, or that you have to pay them for publishing? What, what is that? I mean, if I'm, sample, if, if, if I'm a producer and I'm going to sample someone's record, technically now, whatever it is that you're sampling it is, uh, is part of your recording, and therefore you owe that original, whoever composed that original piece of music there, whoever recorded that piece of original music, yeah. you owe them. Yeah. What you're using, it's like having somebody come in and write you a bass line, or write you sure. lyrics, yeah. or whatever. Just because it's an old record and you sampled it, it doesn't mean that there, it's any less of an important part and an integral part of the track, mm. you, you owe that person money now. But unfortunately, the, the whole game has gotten so out of hand, it's virtually impossible for an independent label to go and clear samples like you used to be able to do. I mean, we've got a couple of um, hip hop producers on the label, like Omega Watts has a 23 track album out there. I don't think there's a single, sing, single sample on there. He basically learned how much it costs to clear a sample. And in reality, if you go to a major label, you're talking about anywhere from 
three grand to whatever crazy number they decide to make up on the day, you know? So we've had um, an artist saying, look, whatever you do, don't give the label you're publishing, you know, if you want to think about publishing deal, but try and keep it to yourself. What, from a label perspective, why do you want to keep the publishing? I guess we don't look at it as keeping it, the kind of PC label word that we use is administering it. Right, okay. In the, from our standpoint, uh, we can do a lot more with the music if we're able to administer the artist's publishing. Being that, as we mentioned earlier, record sales barely keep an independent label alive. Mm -hmm. If we're able to make money for both the artist and the label, and I've got to point out the artist is making a lot more than the label out of a traditional deal, um, by taking the tracks and pushing them to advertising agencies, to creative types, to um, film companies, and getting that music synced up for use on TV or radio or film or what have you, then um, everybody comes out a winner. A lot of people think that they need to control their publishing because the record label is evil or won't let you do anything with it or will tie you up and blah, 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 blah. And possibly, very possibly, that's true in a lot of cases. Mm. I can only speak for Ubiquity and one of the lessons that we learned very early on because of the success Greyboy had in getting tracks in, in movies is that if we're able to administer it, um, we can act very fast. And the amount of people that come to us and say, oh my God, I need a track for a, a Pepsi commercial, but I need clearance on it in two hours, can you do it? If I don't administer that publishing, it means I've got to find someone's manager, someone's lawyer, mm -hmm. the artist. Can we get more signed off? Is everything okay? Oh, you want to look at the agreement? Okay, but I've got to have an answer back with it now because then I've got to get, you know, my guy to look again. And then we've got to, the advertising is going to say, ah, sorry. And then everybody lost out. Right. Can I tell you a sub story? Please. That's a good one. Yeah. From, I can't remember if it was Grey Boy's first album or his second album. He co wrote a track with the guitar player. The guitar player. Um, who will remain nameless, managed to cut a deal with um, a publishing company who took his publishing, I don't know if it was for life or for a certain number of records or whatever, but took control of the guy's publishing. Um, so the track that Grey Boy cut was therefore half um, Grey Boy and, and whoever controlled Grey Boy's publishing, which was us, and half of it belonged to, uh, I think it was Warner's. Mm -hmm. We get a call from um, someone saying they're making uh, a pilot for a show on HBO, big um, cable station, uh, and they wanted to use a Grey Boy track as the soundtrack. And um, you know, if it worked out, they might make three or four shows. It would be a short mini series. And I think that the, that the money was somewhere in the range of 25 grand per episode. So we're like, yes, that sounds great. You can definitely use the track. And then we remembered, oh, oops, uh, Warner's control half of that. I hope I'm not speaking out of line when I say Warner's. Another publishing company controls half of that track. We need to find out. The other publishing company came back and said, 25 grand, we want 40 grand. Mm. HBO walked, and the show ended up being The Sopranos. So, right. from an independent label, you can see how it's a little bit disappointing. <laughs> And even from Grey Boy's perspective, right. um, if somebody else had blown that deal for him, you know, then he, he also wouldn't have seen that money. But I think, obviously, you have to trust that Ubiquity is going to make the right deals for you. Yeah. Uh, I think what it comes down to is not, I've got to keep my own publishing. It's what's, what's the best for me at any given time. Mm -hmm. And if you trust that with this maybe one record that you're doing with with this independent label, that they're really going to push your record and they're really going to take it to, um, to all the right people and make the most of it, more than I can do by myself as the artist, or more than you know, my mate who owns a publishing company can do, because he's got a few contacts, well, maybe I should consider the label. Maybe it's not all, all So bad. basically, we should consider, like, you know, has this person got good link-ups for sync rights, and do they know people in yeah. advertising and all that kind of stuff exactly. when they're thinking about publishing? Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, can you tell us a story about, well, first of all, just very quickly, tell us about what the Rewind project is. Rewind is a series that, um, that we came up with. To be honest, we, we, you learn from your mistakes. 
and if you don't, then you won't be around very long just with, mm -hmm. with any business. And for a long time, we were trying to push this notion that we were a label that didn't really have any boundaries, that we could do old school soul, we could do new school jazz, we could do Latin music, we could do Brazilian music, and here we are having fun doing it. Um, if you try, we tried to put this on a compilation series called No Categories. And No Categories, we thought, encapsulated what we were all about. Had a little bit of everything on there. And if you were a DJ, you might like to pick it up because there'd be some tracks you could play in a club. If you were a listener, you could actually just, uh, you know, average Joe that goes to a record store, you could pick it up and you could put it on your stereo at home and it wouldn't be something you, you know, you would take off because it was obnoxious from a standpoint of being just a pure club record. This was a, a nice kind of mixed tape kind of mm. situation. But no categories never really took off. I mean, we, they did okay. But after, when we got to volume five, we cut it off and we just said, it's just, it's just too hard to push that concept. And we discovered that, you know, with a compilation, you really have to have a concept that really is super strong. And calling your, your compilation no categories is not strong enough. It's the complete opposite. So we've been thinking about, okay, well, you know, compilation market is, 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 is pretty good. It would be nice to kind of keep doing these things. It's a differently, definitely a different way to kind of sell the label from just putting out artist-type releases. And just had this brainwave about doing cover versions and thought that Rewind would be a good title because it's kind of got, you know, roots in old-school yeah. reggae and you know, just DJ situations, and uh, so we thought, okay, well, why don't we ask some of our favorite bands to do cover versions? And they could be old, they could be new. Initially, we thought, well, if we own the rights, they can remix old records, but eventually the series has become about creating new versions of old tracks from scratch, and um, currently we're working on volume five, and uh, we've got people covering everyone from Frank Zappa to Led Zeppelin to mm. Michael Jackson. So say your schedule's clear, my record's finished, it's mixed beautifully and it's ready to go. What's the minimum number of months or amount of time that realistically it's going to take to get everything ready and get it out on the street? We work on a four-month schedule. Right. Not only when you turn <coughs> your record in, um, that's not it. You can't just walk away and say thanks. By that time you also have to have been taking care of paperwork with me which means that uh, you have to have your guest guitar player sign off on something that says hey yeah I was a guest guitar player and yes I got paid and no I'm not going to come back and sue you or hold you up for uh, something down the line like the Sopranos um, and also you know so we have to take care of all the legal business so basically the day when we meet and you say here's the album I also want to have a stack of papers all signed off uh, if we haven't already taken care of business um, so that I know that we're not going to start the process of getting your record manufactured only for someone to pop up and say oh you know what I don't like that agreement um, I'm not going to sign it and we mm. have to hold everything up and as an independent label you cannot afford to have Delays. those kinds of hold ups mm. so ideally there's a four month gap you've handed me the paperwork you've handed me your CD and we have now one month to turn around a promo uh, for us, promo CDs look like this. You know, it's just a, the CD as it is, as you'll find in a regular CD, but in a cardboard case, just because you've got to shave off some uh, some corners on expenses, as all all the information you need on the back, and all of our contact information, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it takes about a month to turn those around, and then that leaves you with three months to promote the record, which is about the amount of time you're going to need if you're going to get your record talked about in the kinds of magazines that you really want it to be talked about. Most magazines are working at least two months and usually three, and some of the obnoxious ones four to six months in advance. How are you supposed to know what's coming out in six months' time? Mm. So, you know, we have to get our records in the hands of journalists who are then going to pitch it, and then, you know, the editors are going to say yes or no, and then they are, you, there's a whole... There's a lot of time. Yeah. And so, while you may be extremely excited about getting that record out, and gee, it's going to be four months. Right. Okay. And then the little nitty gritty, then we've got the art sorted out, the promo gets done. Yeah, we basically use that month. We've got the promo guy working like mad, getting his promos together, getting a press release together. We've got mm. the production guy working on um, not only kicking out the promos, but also working on the finished product. So he's got photographers out there, he's got 
uh, the artwork, he's got all your uh, liner notes and your credit information lined up and he has to assemble that. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, he's, there's, with four months to go, it's not absolutely necessary that I have the finished product show up at the same time as the, the promo copy show up. Mm. But why not take care of business at the same time? Mm. OK, so let me ask you this. On a purely financial level, is it worth it? Um, on certain records, yeah. yeah. On other records, probably not. <laughs> I mean, obviously, the gulf, especially in America, the, between major record label industry and independence is enormous. Sure. Um, well, having on the one hand, yes. Yeah. But on the other hand, there are a lot of records that come out on on major labels where you look at their sound scans and you go, <laughs> yeah. you know, we did, we did that, and they must have spent yeah bucket loads on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so efficient. I mean, well, I'm not talking necessarily about efficiency because efficiency can definitely be sure. better in an independent. But I mean, what kind of numbers are we talking about? What's a what's a result for you? Like, if you, you think, oh, that's a result. We had we, we did well on that one. What's what's good numbers? Um, I mean, on a on let's say on a single, mm. you know, most of our singles sell somewhere in the region of twenty five hundred, three thousand copies. And a good single might sell somewhere between five and ten thousand. Mm -hmm. And we've had singles sell fifteen to twenty. Okay, so I've had, you know, my name's been out there a little bit, you know the fan base is kind of all right, I'm going to, you, you reckon as a calculated estimate that I'm going to sell between five and 10,000 records of my new 12 inch, how much money are you signing me for? Uh, I wouldn't sign you based on a single. I think the single market Okay, but is how much would you pay me to put that out? Um, all right, okay, let's do a different one. Uh, it's a 12 track album and it's going to sell five to 10,000 records. Five to 10,000? Yeah. That's probably not that many. I mean, that's really like a love and hate record. And with a love and okay. hate record, you might expect something in the range of five to 10,000 back for your five to 10,000 sold up front, because mm. it's a risk, mm. you know? Um, and so say, take the John Arnold record, how many does that sell? Love and hate, I mean, love and hate records I would sell less than Ubiquity records. Ubiquity records, I would be disappointed if we sold 5,000. I'd be expecting sure. to sell between 10 and 20. Mm. Um, the rewind compilations usually end up doing about 15 or so. Plus, we have mm. we usually have singles that do really well off of that. Mm. And you combine the end of the project, who knows, maybe we'll sell yeah. 20, 25,000 of a rewind thing. I'm just trying to de demystify it from an artist's perspective because you do hear a lot of people in the modern independent music world kind of saying, artist-wise, saying, well, you know, I don't make any money off, off, off my 12 inches, but they're kind of like a business card for my DJs. That's yeah, all that's I, all. Mean, I mean, you know, how much, if, 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 if I do a record for you and it takes me like 10 months of blood, sweat and tears and love, you know, is it what, you know, how much money am I going to make from that if I sell, you know, what you expect to be good? Well, some of it is, is extremely hard to say because some of it is in the hands of the gods as far as sure. is anyone going to license it. Yeah, I yeah. know it's like how long is a piece of string, but right. I'm just looking for... for, for, a, for let's say from a 12-inch, from a it's extremely hard to make any money. Yeah, that's because what Because it is, like yeah. you say, it, it, these days, it is really just a calling card for your album. Mm. And we don't do any singles at the moment from artists that we're not doing albums from. It's just not, just not worth it. Yeah, um, I might even if I sell five thousand to ten thousand copies. Part of the reason I'm that I maybe sold five to ten thousand copies is that I had to fork out four grand from a remix from someone. Well, that's a big expense to get back on a forty uh, on a twelve inch that we're, you know, hmm. selling for three bucks or something. Okay, so considering you are selling twelve inches and it's not particularly lucrative as a label, how are you surviving? What are the other commercial interests you have? First of all, I'm, I'm still a firm believer, maybe as a, as a DJ, um, in the value of the 12 inch. I love 12 inches. I can't wait to open my pile of 12 inches that arrive every day. I still go shopping for 12 inches every Friday. And we still put out 12 inches, even though sometimes we know it's a losing proposition, because that's part of what makes our little world go around, sure. right? And if I've got a red hot 12 inch from Rebirth that's from a forthcoming compilation album, fingers crossed, people will put two and two together and think, okay, well, the single was great, so I'll go buy the album. And it's just still the basic way to get the word out there. Mm -hmm. and, and even with albums, I mean, oftentimes, the first album that you put out from an artist, maybe you've signed for three, maybe the first album won't recoup. 
but you sold enough where it's worthwhile doing a second one and by the time you get the second one out the buzz is built they've got a much bigger fan base and you put the second one out and things start to catch up and then you start to make some money mm. sometimes these things take time or you do a great boy and you sell 75,000 copies on your first record and which, which brings us neatly on to art, artist development and I just wanted to ask you about that because you you know so what happens when uh, I can't remember the guy's name, is it Armour Ertigan in that film, Ray, you know, he's put all, the, he's, you know, he signs Ray Charles to Atlantic, the early days, da 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 da, da puts all the love and effort into doing it, I mean, it's a slightly different scale, because Atlantic was huge anyway, but, you know, and then Warner comes in and offers him however many million, and, I mean, right. at that point, in the equivalent stage, whatever it is, you've invested in three albums worth in me, no one knew who I was before that stage, and you've given me all that love and time and effort and hard graft, putting me... You know, when finally Universal knock on my door and say, hey man, you know, your stuff's great, here's a million dollars, what's your reaction at that point? Well, I'd be lying if I said there wasn't some disappointment if we're selling a lot of your records. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, I know what my place on this earth is, I know where our record label lies in the grand scheme of things, and, you know, I'm, I'm not the kind of person that's going to hold you back. If you're about to become the next Ray Charles, good on you, cool. And let's be honest, if our agreement is an agreement that help, that covers both the artist and the label, if you get signed to Sony or someone for a million bucks, I'm probably covered a little bit by that, and I'm probably going to end up mm. you know, not losing out completely in, in that deal. And being as you're getting a million bucks, you're probably not going to worry about the small amount of sure. change I'm going to get back out of it. Mm. I mean, I realize that a label like Ubiquity, it, we're often seen as a springboard label in that, you know, someone might come along, put out a record, and then the buzz builds, and boom, they mm. end up getting a beta label deal. Cool. That's okay, as long as it goes organically in that kind of order. Mm. It doesn't always. So you believe in artist development, in putting the effort in, working through, you know, and uh, over time. So when you're looking to sign someone, you're not thinking about, you know, the 12 inch tomorrow and what that's immediately going to do you're kind of thinking three years down the line and what could this person become that kind of thing sometimes i think more and more there are artists out there who just want because it's so much easier to make music these days there are so many artists and there are so many opportunities and people are thinking about putting out their own records and things like that um to some degree more and more people only want to put out one album mm. they with you they want to kind of test the waters mm. if it works out cool you'll come back i know you will if it doesn't well, it didn't yeah. work out for me as much as it didn't work out for you, and you can find your own other label and wish mm. you good luck, and that's that. And so tell me this, in the independent label business, you know, whether that's in the kind of minimal techno world or whether it's in your scene or whether it's in, you know, any particular niche that you might come up with, is it all love or is it actually, you know, I mean, is it cool for me to do a record for you and this guy over here? Is that cool? Or is it, are you kind of like, is that, uh, you know, do, is there a lot of little poaching that goes on between, you There's know? There's definitely some poaching that goes along, and I think that, you know, those, it, it's the same with any kind of business. The, if you're courteous about it, and if, if it's a win-win situation for everybody, then I'm not going to say no, but there's ways to go about doing it. Right. Um, and, you know, there are some labels that are slyer than others, and mm. there are some labels who are more uh, business-like about how things go down and you know let's say take Platinum Pie Pipers a lot of people wanted Boisjid to do remixes for them I'm not going to stop Boisjid from doing remixes and seeing his name plastered all over other people's 12 inches <laughs> yeah, of course. Platinum Pie Pipers remix that would be stupid he can go ahead and do that if, if people want Omega Watts to guest on their records mm. um, then it starts getting a little bit um, more interesting but if he's a guest on someone else's record A I probably can't stop him um, unless I've got it written in there that, you know, the name Omega Watts can't appear on anyone else's record without our permission, then, you know, probably we're just going to say, okay, go ahead, but somewhere on there it should mention something about ubiquity, but only because it really makes sense anyway. If, if mm. some larger producer comes along, likes what Omega Watts is doing, wants him to guest MC on his record, that will probably help sell Omega Watts' record. So, you know, we're not mm. stupid, but, at the, you know, at the same time, just as you said, You've been working your, you know, yourself to death uh, putting together this record. We're going to work like crazy to make sure everybody knows about your record. 
and we, we might spend a ridiculous amount of man hours, we might spend a ridiculous amount of money, and then for have someone else come along and say, I'd like to put out your next record, you know, mm. obviously there's, there's a little bit of a, a shock. But are there. you like bankrolling tours and that kind of stuff? Are you doing tour support and that it's kind of stuff? Totally by artist. Right. S some artists need a lot of help. Others have great booking agents that get really creative and can put your bands on the road without having to come back and ask for, you know, everything to get paid for. Other people need a little bit of dough here and a little bit of dough there. It totally depends. All right, let's go back to the vinyl thing because, you know, as many people are at the moment, I am negotiating the new digital world. I mean, um, I'm come from, you know, vinyl DJing perspective, but now when I go out, you know, I've just got a CD case. When I'm doing a radio show, 60 or 70% of the stuff is coming to me digitally. You know, so if that's what I'm doing, you know, what, what, I mean, how is that affecting your record sales? You know, at the moment, if I don't go into a record shop for two months, I don't feel it as hard as I, right. I would have done. Right. You know, and that, in my, you know, logic would tell you that means, well, there's not that ma as many people going into record shops, buying as many records. How are you, how are you evolving with that? Specifically on the vinyl front, I think we're doing less records, but doing them better. Right. I think that cutting out and doing, you know, random 12 inches here and there has just been a necessity. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean that we're not going to do the 12 inches because we like to do them. Um, I, someone asked me this for a magazine the other day. They were like, you know, has, has, uh, w what's the greatest uh, impact on, um, on your record sales? Is it, is it MP3s? And I, I think that a lot of people use that as an easy excuse now. And well, when MP3s were flying around as freebies everywhere, it was extremely worrying as a, as a record label trying to sell physical product. Um, if your music's good, it's going to sell. I mean, if it's good, the guy is going to go in the store or the woman's going to go in the store and pick up your CD and buy it. If mm. it's crap, they're not. So to some degree, um, it, it hasn't affected sales. Right. Um, on the other hand, we get a nice check from iTunes every month. Mm. So there are people out there buying our, our music digitally mm. and, and legally, and that's great. There are still things out there that are somewhat illegal. And when you see someone's album up online, completely free for download for everybody that you know we had no uh, idea about it is extremely disappointing because not only have we spent a lot of money on that record but the artist wants to get paid at the end of the day mm. so I mean I know this is a you know an old argument and and people see both sides of that but from our standpoint iTunes Napster yeah I mean, it just strikes me that for, you know, from, from, say, iTunes, I mean, I don't actually know how it works. It'd be really interesting to hear you explain financially how it works. But from the perspective of the artist, I mean, say a new Nas record comes out and I like tracks four, six, and eight, I'm not spending like 13 quid, no, sorry, you know, $15 or whatever it is on, on, on the CD. Yeah. I'm going to spend 99 cents on tracks four, six, and eight, and it's cost me $3. Right. You know, so... Everyone's making their own al choices of what an album should be now. Right. And so you are not the A&R person in control of people's decisions anymore. It's more democratic in a way, but from an artist's perspective, you know, if I'm putting this album out and I'm making like 99 cents because someone's buying it, or, or if I'm just putting a track out, 99 cents, how many cents of the 99 cents do I see off that? It's 33 label 66 artists. No, no, I'm sorry. 30, it's... Uh uh, 99 cents to iTunes which is 33 to iTunes is 66 to the label and then the label splits at however whatever agreement you know right. says but in the end it works out possibly better than physical sales oh it yeah. does it's, well you know there's no packaging deductions and there's no yeah you know things. yeah but you buy a 12 inch well where I am you buy a 12 inch for like seven or eight pounds you know in the US I guess it's seven or eight dollars um, you know, you buy it, and, and usually you buy a 12 inch because of one tune. It might have the instrumental right. on it, which is, you know, definitely a bonus, but, or it might have a nice remix on it, but more often than not, it's one tune. So, and now I'm suddenly buying it for a dollar, like 99 cents. I mean, right. is it that vinyl is that expensive? That Vinyl's making? extremely expensive. Right. The jacket is expensive, the mastering is expensive, the glass master that you have to create, it's all extremely expensive. Mm. The 12 inch so, so it's working out the same, effectively, for you? Yeah. And 
all right, I'm a music fan or I'm an artist that wants to put my own record out. Label, uh, record out. Either way, I want to start a label. What's, give me five things not to do, first of all. Not to do. Um, don't rush into it. Most people who either an artist or even me, every time like someone hands me their record, I can't wait to get it out. If it's really good, I'm really excited about it. I can't wait to get it out, but it's just not worth cutting the corners. Always plan for just the worst case scenario happening. Just know that you can't spend your brains out on, on every single record. And if something was to go wrong, um, if you're really seriously setting up a label, make sure you have a little cash in the bank just in case there's a rainy day somewhere along, along the way. Um, make sure you know your legal business. Mm -hmm. um, Make sure you have distribution set up. If you're really starting a label, don't, or even just putting out one record. Don't, okay, okay. Don't start it without knowing that you're going to be able to sell it. Before you finish, what is distribution? Um, I mean, you hear uh, horror stories of, oh yeah, this distributor went down and this label's owned a hundred grand. I mean, how, how can that happen? What's, what, what's the relationship between distributor and label and how can they do that? Uh, from, the point, from the perspective of, of ubiquity, Ubiquity in, in America, at least, is distributed by a company called um, the Alternative Distribution Alliance, which is a sub-distribution uh, company of Warner Brothers, so an arm of Warner Brothers. ADA is the company that allows us to get into record stores like Tower and Virgin and your major chains, uh, and even smaller chains, regional chains, and your good independent <coughs> stores. Mm -hmm. um, your distributor may also allow you to sell some to some outlets by yourself too. They may or they may not. It totally depends on who you're talking to and what the circumstances are. And you can also sell a lot of your own records too. If you have a decent website, uh, we sell a lot of records off of our own site too. But without ADA, we wouldn't be selling the major chunk of the records that we sell, at least in the States. And the same goes for all the other territories around the world. I have a dis distributor in Japan, I have a distributor in England, I have a distributor in France, I have a distributor in wherever. Um, you can cut down the amount of work that you want to do, if you want to, by doing something like a and d deal, where, which what is, is that a production mean? and distribution deal, where right. you basically give your product, your CD, your album, to someone and say, hey, um, I don't have the money, do you like this? Could you produce it and distribute it for me? Um, that's a kind of uh, that's another way to, to kind of start things rolling. It's definitely not something that many people consider once they've kind of been in the business a little while. It's kind of like first rung on the ladder kind of situation. I think mm -hmm. for a lot of people, um, a lot of distributors will not go anywhere near you until you have a catalog of records um, to offer them, or you have the red hot record of the moment which you know can be difficult to have if you don't have distribution it's kind of an evil circle mm. um so yeah we deal with ada we've been with them for a long time we already had a catalog and we went to them um we hope that they sell our back catalog as well as selling our new records uh, and we are in touch with their reps every single day of the year and you know uh for those people that don't know you know they charge you, st record stores charge you to carry your CDs. If you see my CD on display somewhere in Tower Records or on a listening post, I'm actually paying for the damn thing to be there. It's not because they think it's a good record. It's because I actually pay them to do it. Can um, you compete, though? I mean, no. obviously, if you're kind of Def Jam, it's slightly easier to get your record in the racks at the front of HMV than if you're... No. I mean, some, sometimes I'm, I'm not even given the opportunity. I'm told, I'm sorry, you can't actually put your record on display this month because there is no space. Someone bought it. Yeah. What do you mean? My record's coming out this month. But so on the listening post, you mean that, you, that it's not down to the dude at the back who's kind of saying, oh, I like this one, we'll put that on. You have to pay for that as well. There's a small amount of wiggling room and you may find a nice guy somewhere who likes your stuff, who's been a fan of yours, and you butter him up with some promos or something mm. along the way, and maybe he'll sort you out. But mostly it's incredibly corporate and by the book and yes I'm paying to have my music on a listening station and you can bet that if I buy a month's worth of time on a listening station um, with a certain chain that I'm going to call as many of those stores as I can just to make sure that my record is actually sitting there 
on that listening station because um, would wouldn't surprise me if I went into a certain number of the stores and the record's still in the back and I still get charged for an entire month worth of being on that listening station, uh, listening <coughs> station but it's not actually physically there. So, you know, it costs you a lot of money to put a record out. So if mm. you're going to put your, your record out, make sure you have a little bit of dough in the bank and that you've got your distribution situation sorted. Okay, back to the do's and don'ts. Just give us a few more. Um, Do's and don'ts. Um, don't make the same mistake twice. <laughs> Please. Uh, uh, don't. Um, let's see. Uh, I think to underline the fact that don't. It's supposed to be fun. Anyone that I say, hey, I work for a record label, I'm the AR guy, they're like, oh, wow, that must be so cool. And like, yeah, it's cool, whatever. But at the same time, it's also, I got to get up in the day and I have to talk to everybody that I'm working with. Don't. Don't work with people you, you don't want to. Don't sign artists that you just have this slight hint that they're, they're not going to be the, the, the right person for your label. Hello. Nick. Hello. Yeah, I have a very specific question. Okay. Um, Do I owe you money? No, no, okay. not at all. Don't worry. <laughs> um, it was about, well, okay, you put out two of my favorite reissues, really, oh. on Love and Hate. Thank one you. One of them is Don Cunningham. Oh, yeah. The other one is Black Renaissance. Cool. So you were one of those few people that he said knew about it? <laughs> well, I didn't know about it until you reissued it. I, oh, okay. You know, I mean, I was just kind of interested because in both cases, there's a really good story surrounding the original record. You know, Don Cunningham, you had to get it off him at the Playboy Club. Yeah. Black Renaissance, the master tapes being destroyed in a fire. So I yeah. was just kind of wondering how on earth you managed to reissue those records, really. Well, you bring up a good point, actually. One of the reasons that we do re put out these records is it's not just because the music is good, that's the, the major part of it, but if it has a really good story attached to it or if it has some sort of you know, social history or some political angle to it, uh, um, that's even better because it, it, the more story you can tell, the more you can put into these old records, the more interesting the booklet might be. And the more you do the old guy that recorded the record in the first place, a big favor by telling a story and telling people why the record never came out. Just real quick, Black Renaissance was a project uh, from this guy called Harry Whittaker. Harry Whittaker was the um, piano player for Roy Ayers. He was also Roberta Flack's musical director. So he's actually had a really successful career. But the poor guy went and recorded one record on Martin Luther King Day in 1971 or 72. Um, got all these incredible players in the studio in New York and it recorded two tracks, they're about 20 minutes long each. And um, he, uh, Roberta Flack turned up, she's in the crowd, you can hear her kind of like shouting in the background, and it's one of the first jazz and soul records to have like actual, almost sort of semi-rapping on it. It's a really interesting record from a musical point of view. Have you got it? I don't know if I have it or not. Do you want to, do you want to hear it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> so it's it, a very special record. I think it, you should play a bit of it. It's an interesting record. What happened was um, somehow, and Harry's memory is a little bit fuzzy, as with a lot of these guys who recorded this stuff 30 or 40 years ago. Um, he lent a copy to uh, a company in, in Japan just to have a listen and um, never really heard anything back. And uh, either his house burnt down or the house where the master tapes are being stored in was burnt down and he lost the masters. Somehow, uh, probably because Roy Ayers travels a lot, he got to hear that um, his record had come out in Japan. And um, he couldn't understand. And, you know, he's just this one guy in New York. He's new to the business at the time and didn't really understand what had happened and had no way of tracking down these guys in Japan. Didn't speak Japanese, for instance. And um, just couldn't really do anything about it. A number of people over the years have told him, hey, your record came out in Japan. I think one, at one point he may have seen it um, because he knew that on the back uh, they got the dates wrong and it was really important to him that this was a record that he recorded on Martin Luther King Day and it was a tribute to Martin Luther King and they put some random date on the back as to when it was recorded and it was a bit of an insult to him. Um, another good reason to put the record out. So, um, sorry, I'm trying to find it. Anyway, we tracked down Harry Whittaker. He wasn't that difficult to find out of all the people that we found. And um, we uh, asked him if it would be all right if we put the record out. And he said, people are still interested. Who knows about it? And, you know, can you send me a copy? So 
he was cool. He was really happy that we tracked him down and that we, we found a clean copy that we could master from and we were able to put that guy's record out and tell the full story about what really ha happened, how he came to be who he was and all of that good stuff. And it's not looking very good. I'm finding it. Um, Don Cunningham, we put out a record by this guy called Don Cunningham. Um, something for everyone it's called, right? Right. And uh, there's a weird story attached to this record. In the, when we were in the Groove Merchant in the mid-90s, back in the era of the fax machine, this fax came through the fax machine and it said, auction, um, I have a, the one mint copy that anybody knows about of this Don Cunningham record. Bid start at £1,000. Um, get your bids to me by X. Uh, we'll keep everything anonymous and no one will need to know who you are. We were like, what the hell is this record? A thousand pounds? These people are crazy. <laughs> and um, anyway, it sold, and this rumor floated around that Mike, who runs, owns Ubiquity with Jody, had actually bought it and flown to England and paid some guy a thousand pounds. And Mike's not that kind of guy, and was like, this is mad, but fine if someone wants to believe that. But strangely, a friend of ours has actually bought it. And this guy was super cool. He'd send us tapes of stuff all the time. He was really, really into his music. And he said, you know what? You want to um, you wanna borrow this record? You're more than welcome to. And if you ever you know, find him, go ahead and put it out. Just make sure I get thanks. In the end, uh, we found Don Cunningham. He's a, uh, he still sings, him and his wife. They live in Las Vegas. They tour with, I think it's like the Duke Ellington Orchestra or someone like that. And... Um, they, uh, they were delighted to hear that people were still interested in their record, which, as, as you, you pointed out, was actually originally sold in the Playboy Club that his band played at in St. Louis. His dad played, uh, he played in the, uh, the St. Louis Playboy Club in, one of, in the Tiki Room. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was actually uh, the percussionist for Johnny Mathis back in the day. Got to travel with Johnny, Johnny Mathis all around the world. This is the early 70s, le actually late 60s, and um, bought all these tro these crazy exotic tropical instruments, and um, went to the studio one day and recorded this kind of uh, crazy jazz record and featuring all this interesting percussion stuff. And it makes for a great listen now. And we were able to track him down and put him out. And I think I'm going to have to let you down on both. Mm. But tell you to go to ubiquityrecords.com. <laughs> check out the sound. Got it downstairs, but Let me just check one last little file here. Because no, no. I was wondering about the, the taboo. Like, wasn't it a, a jazz dance tune back in the day or something? Or yeah, it has that reputation for some reason. Yeah, you know, you Giles Petersons and your Raina Trubies and people like that were, were amongst the lucky few that, that had copies. And um, they definitely championed it and, um, you know, helped make it. And I guess um, on Black Renaissance, I mean, did uh, Jazz and Over pay you for the bass line they sampled of it? Actually, that, that bass line, um, <laughs> it's funny that you asked because on one record, they actually used the bass line and it was ours and we put it out. So, yes. On um, the other one, no, I'm going to have to give them a call about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're, you know, like I was saying... I mean, I think to be but honest... But that, that's an interesting one as well on the record. Like, you know, is that your money or is that Harry's money? Uh, that would be s probably split between us, depending on, on, on what kind of agreement we have. In, in the most part, a lot of these guys, they're, first of all, they're absolutely amazed that anybody is interested in their music. And secondly, um, a lot of them could use some dough. It's not always the case. Um, and obviously, if I can buy a record outright from someone, we'll still pay them royalties and stuff, um, then, then they'll get some more money and we're able to do a lot more with it. Mm. And, uh, um, and, and yeah, we'll own the rights to it. And if someone samples it or someone else wants to license it, then they come to us. Harry or Don or whoever involved would still get paid. Okay. I guess like one final question, which is kind of generic, but I mean, what's your favorite 12 that you ever put out on the label? I'm really crap at the one. I'll give you a top ten or something. Yeah, but, that's fine. I mean, I think some of the favorite ones were when um, Seiji remixed Patar. We had that opaque, uh, it was an opaque remix. Have you got that, actually? The Crossing. No, you, you're testing me, because I don't mm. keep the oldies on my little MP3 player here. But um, 
that was such a kind of that was a, a big record at the time, wasn't it? Yeah, it was more than big. It, it was a big Benji was, I mean, Yeah, it was. It was like in a microscopic way, it was big. <laughs> In a, in, a, in a small part of the world, it was definitely a, a, an anthem. I really like the records, the singles in particular, where we really kind of blurred some boundaries and, and united some interesting people. So, for instance, we got Johnny Blass, who's like an L.A. percussionist, jazz guy, and we got him remixed by Carl Craig. And the end result was mm, this 12-minute, yeah. 15-minute piece of Detroit techno meets uh, traditional Latin jazz, and it, it was a crazy record. And... Um, it was may it not have or done anything, but ended up selling about 15,000 copies and getting licensed around the world, and, and people liked it. So it was, it was good. I really like the ones that sell. <laughs> uh, but, you know, those, those are a couple of favorites because they kind of broke, broke some boundaries and there were some interesting collaborations between folks. Mm -hmm. Cool. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm not quite sure. Are you putting out uh, Sarah Creative Partners album, in their debut album? Or is no. it Sound in Color? Um, no, Sound in Color aren't. Okay. I can't tell you anymore. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, well, I just wanted to know how you feel about them releasing an album on Kanye West's good music album, but then that's probably not a good question. Um, I, you know, my general point of view on our artists who signed to Ubiquity and then go on to do much big, bigger things, is that's cool as long as it kind of happens in a nice, organic way. And um, I can't come out on the Sarah thing, just unfortunately. But, um, you know, if, if someone was to come along and snap at one of our artists after they fulfilled their obligations to us, cool. It's great. I mean, I know that that, that way that we weren't wrong, you know, that, that, that someone else thinks that the music that we were into can be brought to an even bigger audience that it's impossible for me to bring them to. That's cool. Okay, um, another question. Um, I think you're, I'm not quite sure what the legal affairs are, but are you distributing or releasing the records by True Thoughts in the United States? Yeah, True Thoughts um, had a couple of interesting records that we knew they should be doing much better with over here, but I mean, this is just, this is to illustrate the point of how uh, uh, frustrating distribution can be. True Thoughts is a you know, fairly well known label in, in England and in Europe. Um, independent but you know selling some decent sized records but that we I asked them how many records are you selling over here and you know they'd be lucky to sell five eight hundred copies or something in the states and I'm like well I can kill that for you and 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 by doing that we can probably also open up some other avenues for you so we tried with the first Quantic record actually it was the second Quantic record by this time um, we put it out simultaneously it's the only way that we'll do it and um, so that the record comes out in England and in the States at the same time. Um, and, uh, you know, I think for that first Quantic record, we probably sold something like seven or 8,000 copies in the States. And um, not only that, but we got them into an iTunes Pepsi <coughs> commercial. Um, we've got them into countless TV shows. It's just been an, a nice kind of win-win situation. We've had three of their records now. We're going to put out the Bamboos album that they're putting out in February. Um, so it's just one of those kind of win-win situations. They're realistic. They know that if we pay them a little bit up front, it's more than they will have made just selling it on import. Uh, and if we all make money down the line through licensing or sales, then everyone comes out on top. Yeah, and you're doing a really good job because for me, I live in Switzerland, and it's usually easier for me to get the US um, <laughs> ubiquity, ubiquity version bizarre. than the true th thoughts one. So yeah. That's bizarre. Strange. Well, you need to have a little bit of true thoughts about that. <laughs> or I should thank my Swiss distributor. Um, still on the topic of reissues, do you, when you do reissues, you always have access uh, of the original master tape, or do you...? No, not at all. When cool. we do, it's a beautiful thing um, for two reasons. Firstly, you usually get the better sound, and secondly, if they have the... Uh, multi-tracks before it was mixed to, a, to, to one tape, then we can get things like remixes and things done and it opens up opportunities that you can't have if you just have the album, which unfortunately is majority of the time is the case for records that are you know, late 60s, early 70s. A lot of those guys 
moved house, got divorced, their house burnt down, they lost it, they left it in a puddle of water, it broke, left it at the studio. You know, there's a million reasons why they don't have a master tape anymore. And um, unfortunately, in those cases, we have to work from vinyl. And I go to Fantasy Records, and they use some, you know, pretty high-end needle on a record to recreate masters, and they'll put it through this process called de-clicking, where they take out all the little pops and things that you might get on an LP. Oftentimes, we'll try and search out two or three copies of an LP, and then they can kind of take the best bits and glue everything together. And then you have, you know, hopefully a, a reasonably good sounding record. With most of our reissues, it comes with a little warning that says, hey, look, this isn't going to sound like your new Madonna album. This is going to have some dirt. And um, I, I don't think you've ever done uh, like proper high quality 180 gram reissue, are you? We did on a few records in the past, um, but we just never really found that demand was there to, to do it on every single thing. It, vinyl's just gotten so expensive. I mean, it's insanely expensive. Um, and some of these reissues, we might sell half of what we sell in total um, on vinyl, as, as we do on CD. It's just, it's just too, much, too much money. Um, maybe at some point we'll do some kind of best of love and hate and have it be all <coughs> super high, high end vinyl, just for you. Thank you. Okay. Um, another question. How did you get to um, act like Breakers Throw were doing pretty well on Stones Throw? I mean, did they not have a contract or anything with Stones Throw anymore? Or did you just. No, apparently not. And, um, you know, I think more and more uh, over the past two years, we've decided we should start working with artists who have some kind of previous history. I mean, one thing you'll find if you are going to start a label, the most frustrating phrase that you get, and we still get it 15 years later, is, well, you don't have any sales history. How am I supposed to get sales history if you won't carry my record to start with? You know, it's kind of this really frustrating game you play with people. Uh, some record stores won't even carry your music. I mean, that to me is just, you know, one of the most frustrating parts of, of, of this little game that we play here. And then when they tell you that they're not going to carry you because you have no sales history in their store, um, wait a minute, that's because you wouldn't carry the record before, so how am I supposed to get there? So anyway, going back to answer your question, one of, the, one of the ways to get by that is to start to sign acts that have slightly bigger appeal, possibly because they've been out playing like crazy or because they've got previous record out on a label like Stone's Throw or whatever. Breakestra just wanted to um, you know, do something a little bit different and um, we like Breakestra, they're a great live band, they kind of have that West Coast thing going for them that we really wanted to represent, so it seemed like a, a match made in heaven. Do you have a question? Hi. Hi. Uh, is it true that the worst um, time to release a record is in the summer? Or? For, for Ubiquity it is, yeah. I don't know if other labels find anything different, but um, because we do our own distribution mm -hmm. um, and we, we manufacture all of our own product, we have distributors in every single territory. So France, and Spain, and Switzerland, and Germany, whatever, they're all different distributors. And I don't know, well, I, I can understand, and it would be nice if the same thing happened here, but everybody seems to go to sleep in, in, in Europe, at least in the music business, between about June the 1st and August the 30th. Yeah. And they have this nice long vacation, and they refuse to do any work, and they don't really carry your music. And unless you have something that's started to sell a lot, they won't order again until come September 1st. Okay, mm. so is there a month uh, you recommend? <laughs> Actually, like the start of the year, better. The start From the year. end of January till about May is a really good time to put your record out. Because there's a lot of festivals in the summer, and if you have a really good record that caught on in February, March, April, um, mm. you might see some, you know, you might see yourself getting booked for some of those late summer tours. By the same token, if you have a really great record in the fall, that's really when the bigger festivals are getting booked and you, you're going to end up getting some more work during that following summer. But good sales period is end of January because everybody else is kind of still recovering from Christmas and New Year and trying to get their act together. If, if you had gotten your act together back in October, November and you had your January record ready, um, you might be the only one of very few labels uh, with your record out in the marketplace in January. 
and you have a little less competition, it's a little less difficult to get space on shelves and it's a little bit easier to get your records reviewed in magazines. Yeah. So for me, January is great if you've got yourself sorted out okay. far enough in advance. Does that help? Hi, um, just a quick question. Uh, in Belgium, there's a story like 2009, it's going to be finished with vinyl. Is there anything true about it? There's a, I'm sorry, can you say that again? There's a uh, store? A story, a story that like is. a story that's going on. Oh, the, like, oh no, no more vinyl? Is yeah, that yeah. that's what they say. I mean, they've said that for a long time, right? So. Uh, but yeah. it's not like uh, you know anything about it and it's like a new mark and everything with a digital mixing index that's uh, mm. like... Uh, I mean, I, th I think the record business seems to go through these crazy phases and it must have been terrifying the first time out when you were a record label back in what, early 70s I guess, when the cassette was introduced. Mm. You must have just, you know, excuse my French, but you must have just shit your pants. Can you imagine the first time someone said, oh by the way, we're putting out this thing that's called a cassette and you can record the album, I mean you can pass it on to all your mates and you can make as many copies mm. as you want and no one's going to buy your records anymore. And we're going to actually sell records on cassette too. People must have thought, well, that's the end of the LP. Well, it didn't happen, right? And then the CD came along, and you can record on CDs, and CDs haven't died, mm. LPs haven't died. There are still pressing plants in the States who are still pressing vinyl. I know that in, in uh, I don't think there are, are there any pressing plants in England anymore? I don't know. Um, I think maybe one, but I think, I mean, it's an interesting question because it raises the idea, well, what is keeping vinyl alive? Is it people right. loving vinyl or is it DJ culture? I, I think, and, and to answer both of your questions, that it's a mix. And that's why we only do some final 12 inches because we know that maybe it is a limited DJ market but, but if I'm but, I mean if I'm 16 and I and I'm get, want to get into being a DJ and I go and see my favorite DJ on a Saturday night and he's playing off a computer or off CDJs why on earth am I going to go out and buy records I I I don't know where it's going to go to be yeah. honest with you but I do know that on the reissue side of things that half of what we sell is on vinyl because people want the right. LP where things head off. I mean, I don't, know, I don't see myself turning up to a club with two iPods and plugging it into the new iPod mixer and using it, but I'm sure there will be people who do. Maybe I'm just an old fart when it comes to that. Uh, personally, I've always preferred playing records to playing CDs even. So, I don't know, from a DJ perspective, it may be, diff it may be different. Maybe things will really trickle out as a possibility, but from a collector standpoint, from the reissue type things that we do, I've never seen um, record sales take a dip, and if anything, they're stronger, or they're as strong as they, they were 15 years ago. Hi, on the subject of recycling, uh, I have a question about sampling, like you talked a bit about major labels really paying attention to who's doing what with their uh, catalog or like the stuff they use rights to. How does that work in a company like, like yours? Like, how do you pay attention to your material not being used like illegally? Well, two things. M oftentimes it's not the label, oftentimes it's the publishing company yeah, who, are, but who are keeping an eye out. But like when you're whatever, owning any. the rights to... Yeah. Um, for us, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't really spend all my time worrying about who's sampling. And in general, uh, you know, there are some e extremely uh, clever ears out there, like you were saying, Questlove early can tell if so it's a snare hit or something like that. Yeah. There are lots of people who uh, have an ear for that kind of thing and can recognize a sample and name it in a second and there's a website dedicated to that kind of stuff and I don't really you know, pay any attention to them but if there's a blatant sample out there and someone has sampled one of our tracks, well, you know, it, it sort of depends. I mean, the, there are friendly ways to do business and then there's like, uh, you know, if someone's got a number one trillion dollar selling hit and it's blatant use of, um, a, of a track that we own, well, probably we or, you know, more importantly, the artist should see a chunk of that. Mm. I, I, I don't know, it's a strange thing. On the one hand, independent labels, I think, are maybe a little bit more laxed about it and then Benji starts a label and one of his label samples one of our things and maybe one of our guys cuts up one of his records. You know, we're probably not going to call each other and go, dude, I'm suing you. You know, mm -hmm. but it, 
that, you know, there are things, there are, there's just a certain way of, of going about doing these things legally. And, um, you know, I think independent labels too might have a kind of code of ethics between them. And if, if I was, if Stone's Throw was to call us and say, hey, one of, you know, Madlib wants to sample whatever, something on love and hate, I'm not going to charge him a major label fee. We'll come up with some sort of stupid little friendly agreement and that'll be the end of it. It gets annoying when you're an artist and you have to call some uh, major label telephone number where you listen, literally I've done this, you call and you have to listen to a recorded message that lasts for 30 minutes about how to clear a sample, about where to download the form Seriously. to fill out and who to send it to. It's insane. I'm just ridiculous. And, you know, they want to know that you're going to sell 25,000 units mm. or they're not even going to give you permission. Um, I mean, at some point, music is meant to be shared, right? Whether that means me trying to license a track from somebody to put on a compilation or, or maybe to some degree it, um, from a sample. And if you go about business the right way and, uh, and, and, and people are paid a sort of fair amount, not an insanely outrageous amount, then everyone comes out a winner. Hmm. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Good. Are you holding your hand up or are you just leaning against the wall? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to answer your question. Yeah. <laughs> Any more? Right, well, you need to make sure you check out that um, Black Renaissance record. Amongst yeah, other I'm really things. sorry about that. Um, I've got a online. few bits downstairs, and um, no doubt Andrew will happily show you the music that he has got. Yeah, I've got but business cards and stuff too if anybody wants to email or get in contact or whatever. Mm. But I've definitely learned a few things I think we all have, so thank you very much for your time.